It is so good to see you. It is so good to see you. It is, it is so good to see you. You sitting right over there, you sitting right over there, in flesh and bone and wonder and awe. And yes, you guys way back there being really good Lutherans sitting in the back, it is so good to see you. And you can see me and her and him and them. Oh, we're all here together again in person once again. We hear each other as we collectively call ourselves into a time of worship. We hear God's voice echo in each other's as we recite the song. We feel the spirit moving as we, dare I say, share in the same breath as we sing it together of God's loving word surrounding us in front of you, behind you, to the side and diagonally, is a real life person. It is so good to see you. The last time that this Virginia Synod met in person like this was 2019. It was a lifetime ago. It was a different life ago. Back then, we would give the evil eye to someone that we were suspecting was double dipping in the spinach dip. <laughs> and now, you can't swallow wrong and cough in public without declaring, no, I'm choking, I'm not sick. <laughs> what a life we have all just lived. Waking up in March of 2020 and all of a sudden things were different. Some of us at first were excited that we might have a week of two or two off of an, of an unexpected break. Others of us immediately felt the walls close in as we were told to stay home, to not visit each other, to not be out. No matter how we woke up in March of 2020, one thing is certain. We were all walking into a wilderness, not having any idea how long we would be there, what the terrain would look like, or the trials and pains we would suffer along the way. It has been three years, not 40, but this wilderness has been more dense and painful and trying than, than almost anything else that we have collectively gone through. And we all haven't made it to this side. Yes, there are new faces in our midst right now, but there are many faces missing right now too. And I just wonder why? Why this wilderness now? Why were these people taken? Why are we feeling oppressed and invaded upon? Why? Why, God, why? Why bring us into this time of pain, of suffering, of distance, of isolation, of change and disruption? Why, we were doing fine. Why did you let this happen? Why is the water that is available bitter? Why did you bring us up out of the land of Egypt where we were full to have a starve in the wilderness? Why is there no water to drink? Why? Why? 
the Lord had claimed a people, had delivered them from slavery and had set them free. He guided them by day and night down along the coast to Mara. Here, the Lord turned bitter water into sweet, drinkable water. And down the coast, they continued to Elam, surviving and thriving off of the offerings of the Red Sea, where to this day, you can still catch grouper, coral trout, and even king mackerel. But then at Elam, the people were turned 90 degrees to the left and were guided to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, which they could see in the distance. The only problem between Elam and Mount Sinai, there was nothing, a desert, a wilderness. There was no thing that the Israelites could see or fathom that would allow them to live, to make it to the other side of that wilderness. This turning left to this new path, to this uncharted area, was a death sentence. Why? Why, God, did you bring us out of Egypt where our bellies were full to this place, to this wilderness, to this certain death? Why? Why, God, are you making us walk this path, one that we know we will not survive? Why? Why, God, did you claim us under your rule, moving us from one vicious ruler to another? Why? Why? I can't stand up here and give you answers. I can't stand up here and speak on behalf of God and tell you I know fully and understand God's actions. I just can't. But I will ask the questions with you. But I am wondering, are we asking the right question? Maybe instead of asking why, we should be asking who. I am the coordinator of a new ministry here in the Virginia Synod called Truth and Love. It is a ministry that walks with congregations that are in conflict to help them reach an agreement that will help them move into a future. And it is also a ministry that teaches the tools of help. When asking clarifying questions, one question that you should never ask is why? The question why, though direct, can put people on the defensive. It can make people feel like someone wants to know the answer so that they can judge you or your reasoning or your actions. The question why often is a diversive question. If you are truly curious why something happened, if you want to listen to understand and not judge, then asking a question like, how did you come to that conclusion? Or what were you hoping to accomplish? Are better questions that can then lead to more open and constructive conversations. So maybe, instead of the Israelites, instead of us asking the question why, why, God, did you allow this to happen? We should be asking instead, who, or where, or what? Who is this God that brought us out into this wilderness? Where, O oh Lord, are you directing us? What, O oh God, are you teaching us? What do you want us to learn? 
we look at these questions and we learn more about who God is and God's desires. The point of the Exodus was the creation of a people. Against the harsh backdrop of the wilderness, the Israelites learned that if they were to be the people of God, they must develop a faith born out of complete dependence on God. They are freed from Egypt, but now they belong to Yahweh, to the Lord. They used to serve Pharaoh, but now they serve the Lord. And now in the wilderness, they are learning what that means. In the Africana Bible, edited by Hugh R. Page Jr., it says that the wilderness is a place that is literal and figurative. It is a place of isolation and trial, but it is also a place of intimacy. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, on the first Saturday, after the first cycle of the moon since they had left Egypt, God revealed the Sabbath to the people and used manna as the instructor. They got their first manna in the wilderness, on the wilderness of sin, and they were to collect it for six days with gathering a double portion on that sixth day and then rest on the Sabbath for the first time in the history of humanity. Sabbath was just given to them. They had to learn how to rest. And almost immediately, this new Sabbath idea was turned into one of God's greatest commandments. This day of rest wasn't just given so that people could sit back and relax, but it was used as a tool to grow closer to one another and closer to God. The Sabbath is a rest, a break from the grind of work and obligation so that we can concentrate on relationships with each other and with God. So what does it mean to be God's people, to exist under God's rule? You have Pharaoh, who was fearful of the Israelites and so enslaved them, working them to the bone for his own desires and will and wants. And then you have God the one who mandates rest, who provides the sustenance for life to continue, and also the substance of time, of rest, of relationship building. All of the Israelites came together to learn how God wants them to do something new and different. And so this time in the wilderness is a time of trial. It's a time of unlearning what they have known for generations. And it is a time of intimacy with God, getting closer to God and to each other and learning a new way of life. This time in the wilderness is a time of changing direction, both literally and figuratively, of walking together, of unlearning some things and learning some things new, covenantal things. I wonder though, what would this story look like if it was written about us, for us today? Would we miss the whole point like the Israelites did? A representative assembly of Virginians set out from Marion, Stafford, Stephen City, and Yorktown 
and came to the wilderness of Roanoke College, which is between Blacksburg and Lexington. On the ninth day of the sixth month, three years after they had quarantined because of a global pandemic, the whole gathering complained and murmured and grumbled, saying, if only they could have let us stay at home on our couches where we could have done this on Zoom with our cameras off. <laughs> where I could have worked on landscaping my island in Animal Crossings. Why did we have to come all this way? This could have been an email. <laughs> Why have you brought us out here into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with boredom and Robert's rules? <laughs> because this is a wilderness, a wilderness of learning. It is a wilderness of discovery of living into our complete dependence on God. It is a wilderness of getting closer to each other and closer to God. During our time here, we will be collectively discerning God's call to us, God's call on where the Virginia Synod is going we will discern and listen to see if God is turning us sharply to a brand new course, to a new greater destination. We will gather together to worship our God who claims us, who provides for us, who fights for us, who dies for us. We gather as the people of God, as God's people. This time of worship, this time of discernment, this time of unlearning and learning anew, of listening is only possible because you have gathered here and have proclaimed, this is my God, and I am one of God's people. And so, it is so good to see you, people of God, bearers of God's image, who are called beloved and good. It is so good to see you, people of God who are washed clean by the one we partake of, the one who fills up our empty, broken, outstretched hands. It is so good to see you, people of God, who are stirred into action, stirred into listening and telling, stirred into relationship. It is so good to see you. It is so good to see you. It is so good to see you. <laughs>